Welcome everyone. My name is Christopher Pauly. I'm a research scientist with Front Range Biosciences on their research and development team. And today we're going to be talking about kind of uh, terpenes, what they are, how they're made, and some of the enzymes that are responsible for them and what an enzyme is. Um, and so we'll jump right into it. I thank you for all uh, for being here today and I look forward to hopefully teaching you something. And so we'll move to the next slide here and we're going to dive right into what is a terpene. And a terpene is a taste and smell molecule. And so when you smell cannabis, most of what you're smelling is the terpene profile. And so what are those made of? If you see down in the right hand corner here, I have an isoprene unit highlighted. That is a carbon building block for what a terpene is. So terpenes are multiple of these isoprene units built together. And so we classify terpenes based on how many of these isoprene units they contain. So a mono would be one isoprene unit, and that's a monoterpene, or diterpenes two, or sesqui is just three or more of these isoprene units kind of stacked together. And so one interesting thing about the terpenes is that they have bioactivity in the sense that they're changing the effect of the cannabis you smoke um, or ingest. And that is something that is really kind of key to understanding what cannabis is and how it works with your body in the way it does. And so they're present throughout the plant kingdom, um, all the trees, herbs, flowers, fruits, things that you normally smell and are like, wow, this has a great smell to it. That's the terpenes responsible. And so a lot of people talk about the forest activity of when you walk through a forest, you get the smell that's the terpenes that are interacting with your body that you're you're able to kind of talk to the plants in a way or your body's responding to what the plants are saying. And so within cannabis, this is really the de uh, designation between sativa and indica. And so when we talk about two strains with very different effects, I give Jack Herrera and OG Kush as an example here. It's the same active ingredient in both. THCA is kind of the main most abundant compound in there. And that's the same between the most sedative indica you can buy and the most energetic sativa. And so what's really guiding that change is the terpenes. And so I, I kind of look at it like your terpenes are the steering wheel in your car and THC is the gas pedal and CBD is the brake pedal. Um, and so that, that's a good analogy to understand kind of how you can smoke THC in two different strains and get two vastly different effects. Um, but that's not the entire story with cannabis because of the entourage effect. We have over 500 bioactive chemicals and those chemicals are going to interact with your body as well. And when they're all together in your body, they have an entourage effect or a synergistic or antagonistic effect, which changes how a, a given terpene works with your body. And so if you see down here, it's kind of interesting in this bottom right hand corner. I have the difference in alpha and beta pinene, which those two are a really interesting one if you ever get a chance to smell them you can smell this chemical bond change here. And so the double bond is up here in beta pinene um, up at the top. And then in alpha pinene, it's just within the ring structure. And so when you smell those two, they have vastly different smells and also different effects within your body. And so that's just what feeling that double bond change and how it's binding to your receptors, which is a very interesting thing for some of these isomer, uh, isomers of different terpenes. And we'll get into a little more of the chemical structures on this next one. We talk about how many terpenes are there and what they are. And so over 20,000 different terpenes have been identified in plants. Within cannabis, we know about 150 of those. Um, and with the genes that make them are 70. And so what we can tell there is that we know 70 genes are responsible for around 150 terpenes, but we don't know which gene does what. And so when we look at kind of trying to figure that out, the easiest place to start or the best way to classify cannabis is by terpene dominance. And so you'll see some of these uh, structures around the outside of my slide here. Um, and it's just basically the built up over and over again in different ring structures, different conformations. And each of those has a unique effect with your body. And so, and a smell to it as well. So you can identi readily identify these things just by grabbing a jar of cannabis and smelling it. And so some of the most abundant terpenes that we find in cannabis are listed out there for you. Um, that's not all of them. And there's definitely a few more that can uh, pop up. And we're always kind of discovering new types of cannabis out there because they're really diverse species. And so we're still working to understand kind of how many different terpenes are out there um, as our chemical methods get better, our genetic methods get better. And what we're finding is that these terpene synthases can be really indicative of what the terpene profile is and kind of how that breakdown happens. 
And so there's many different terpene synthases and each of them make multiple products. And so that's kind of an interesting fact that they'll take in the same um, kind of chemical before and turn it into multiple different chemicals. And we'll get a little more into that on this next slide of what an enzyme is. And so when we look at an enzyme in general, it's kind of the central dogma of biology, they call it, that a gene is transcribed into mRNA that's translated into a protein. And so these proteins are just strings of amino acids that get strung together. And in your cell, they fold into these really weird conformations that will have a function to them. And so you'll bind a substrate. A substrate or a precursor are the same things. It's just the chemical that goes into the enzyme to be converted into something else. And then what the enzyme does is lower that chemical activation energy needed for the chemical change to happen. And or a, it's a catalyst to making this um, reaction happen. And we can get a kind of predictable profile out of an enzyme. And so up in the upper left, uh, the upper right hand corner here, we see kind of a simplified diagram of what an enzyme does. And it's a lock and key mechanism of the substrate really fits into this active site of the enzyme and it'll bind very strongly to that. And so once it's bound, you have this enzyme substrate complex that will cause the chemical change to occur. Then your product is bound to the enzyme and that product isn't wanting to bind to the enzyme as much as the substrate was, so it gets released. And the simple, simplified way is you have this one substrate that's kind of a triangle and a half circle, and then you get two different colors, triangles, half circles out. That's a really simplified idea of this. If you see right below that, that's what this actually looks like. And so it's these kind of beta helices or beta plated sheets and alpha helices that form together. And then you can see um, those little blocks floating around have chemical structures on them. And that would be a substrate that would be kind of trying to fit into this protein. And once it does, it'll bind to it. And then that chemical conversion happens. And that's when you get your product profile out. And so when we look into a given TPS gene um, in cannabis, it's a pretty complex story here. And so we know each enzyme doesn't make only one terpene but how many does it make? And kind of, are there more than one terpene synthase making the same product? So what we see is um, in this really nice graph put together in Booth at L2020, they had um, shown kind of what each terpene synthase gene does. So if you go across a row for a given TPS gene there, you'll see if it makes one product or some make up to four or five products. Um, and basically, that's a predictable profile coming off that gene by itself. When we have two enzymes there that are both taking up the same precursor, it's going to compete with each other. And so then you'll have basically a competition going on. You'll know what each enzyme does by itself, but what about when they're competing for this precursor? And so we really try and kind of do functional characterization studies where we look at this competition, seeing kind of how much a given enzyme wants to bind that substrate or the affinity it has to bind that substrate. And then we go ahead and um, classify that and try to assign numerical values that we can rate these things and say, oh, if you have this TPS gene, you're going to be able to eat up all of your GBP and make beta-pinene or terpinoline or whatever terpene that we would be talking about at the time. And so we use phylogeny and kind of gene similarity to figure out which of these genes cluster together, maybe have a similar function. And also uh, subcellular localization is a big key in understanding these terpene synthase genes because the, the substrates differ in different subcellular compartments. So, so depending on where you are in the cell, you may have FPP or GPP and make a different terpene given you express the same gene in both of those locations. And so we'll get into a little bit more about what the terpene synthase family in cannabis looks like. And one important thing about this is having a gene in your genome doesn't mean you're going to make that terpene. And so we look at expression of these genes, part of that central dogma idea. And we're really looking for kind of where are these terpene synthases expressed? How expressed are they? Um, and are they in a place that's expressed without much competition or with the competition we want? And so when you look at this uh, heat map over on the right side of the uh, slide here, you'll see we have a bunch of different flower types at the bottom as well as a, a stem a root and a shoot. And so those are just different tissue types. And so you'll see within each tissue type, there's a different set of TPS genes expressed. 
And that's a really important thing because each of these are doing a different thing. If you express terpenes in your stem, you're usually trying to deter a stem boring pest or pests that live on the stem or climb up the stem versus in the root, you're more signaling to something underground like mycorrhiza or an underground pest that's going to be living there. And so within this idea of competition, we're having to say, are you expressed in the same tissue around the same time point of development um, and kind of consider that within competition. And then there's also these environmentally induced ones that we see in response to a given pest or a pathogen that you'll express certain terpenes to fight that off. And the plants are very sophisticated in this way that they have developed over millions of years to fight off these pests and pathogens. And so we're, we're kind of balancing this of what's the natural expression of these terpene synthases versus what's kind of this environmentally induced expression. And so when you talk about competition, not all of these enzymes compete with each other. You can kind of break them down into classes of genes. So TPSA is a class, TPSB is a class, and they each make their own um, type of product. So monoterpenes have their own class, that would be TPSA, I believe. Um, and basically each of those classes take their own precursor. So some of these genes aren't competing with each other because some are going after FPP, some are going after GPP. And so we see that and we it's kind of considering all of that in this bigger picture of genetics and when you start to test for these genes, it, it gets really, um, you have to have all these considerations in place. And so we'll keep moving on here and kind of where do these terpenes come from? And so we know about the genes, we know the gene needs to be there, but what makes that precursor for that gene? And so that's something we always have to look at. We know GPP, you need that in your cell to make monoterpenes or FPP to make sesquiterpenes. But where does the FPP come from or where does the GPP come from? And so if you see over on the um, right hand side of this graph, I have two pathways there, the MEP pathway and the MEV pathway. Those are where you get the FPP and the GPP from. And so you see at the end, there's TPS genes and each of those uh, purple uh, acronyms are going to be an enzyme. Each of the black words are going to be a, a precursor and or product. So each pyruvate and G3P are a substrate that make DXP as a product. And then that DXP is a substrate for DXR genes that makes MEP. And so that's how you read these pathways. And you'll realize um, very quickly that it's a multi-step process. If you knock out one part of this pathway, you're not going to be able to make it to the rest of it. And so what we try and figure out is what's going to determine our total amount of terpenes versus what's going to determine our, total, our, our terpene product profile. And so the TPS genes are really great at predicting a profile. So if I test for the TPS genes genotype, I can tell you how much of this terpene versus this one you're going to make. But I can't tell you what the total amount of terpenes is because that's determined upstream from the TPS genes. They have no influence or say on how much of this terpene is produced. And so a lot of times people wonder, do terpene production take away from cannabinoid production? Because GPP sounds really familiar and something that I know is involved in cannabinoid biosynthesis. And so as we move into there, we'll see that these two pathways are indeed connected. They're using the same building blocks, GPP specifically. And so there's a relationship between monoterpenes and cannabinoids that it's very, um, kind of flexible in a way, because depending on how much this parental transferase wants to pull GPP, it's competing with the um, TPS genes to pull GPP. And so you have this kind of competition going on between two separate pathways. And even though all the TPS genes are competing with each other, they also have another com a competitor to them. And so that's where, given that you have a set amount of upstream precursors, the more monoterpenes you have, the less cannabinoids you'd have, and vice versa, the more cannabinoids you'd have, the less monoterpenes, just because it's pulling from a set amount of GPP produced by that plant. And so the next kind of question after we have all this understanding of how do all these things work together, what are these genes doing, um, is can I genetically test for a terpene that I'm interested in and guarantee that I'm going to produce it? And so a lot of people ask that, and it's it should be a simple answer, like we can test for your CBD gene and tell you that you'll make CBD or not. But with terpenes, it's a little more complicated. And so we'll kind of look at that on the next slide here. 
And that is where we get into what is genetic testing for terpenes. And so we're really reading this DNA. If you look up in the left-hand corner, that's the code we're trying to read and what it actually is. So when people talk about A, C, T's, and G's, this is really what they're talking about is these chemical structures that have an interaction with each other. So your A's bind with your T's and your C's bind with your G's. And we're reading that code as a linear string. So we would read this side of the code. If you started with that pink G at the bottom there, you'd say it's a G T T C A is the genetic code of this gene that we're reading. And so first we test for that. Do we have that gene in our genome? It's the sequence there that we're looking for. And once we can say, yes, we've inherited this gene as we'd expect um, in some of the offspring, we've selected those offspring. The next question you have to ask is, is this gene intact and expressed as mRNA? So you can have what's called a frame shift or a truncation in the gene. And those are basically the way DNA is read in codons. You'll have a stop codon. And if that's in the middle of your gene, you don't make a successful protein anymore. And so we're really looking for the entireness of the gene, as well as its expression, because that's controlled by something outside the gene. And so once we can find that it's expressed as mRNA in the strain of, in the offspring that we wanted to inherit this gene, we can then start to look at, is it expressed in the tissue I want? Did I inherit this with a different promoter or enhancer region that's changing um, where this gene is going after it's translated? And so then, after that, you consider, is it competing with anything else? What else does it have to compete with to actually produce this terpene in the given subcellular location that it's expressed? And so now that we kind of can answer all of those questions and figure out, okay, we inherited this gene we want, it's intact and expressed in flower, say, because I want to make my flower smell better. Um, it's the only gene there fighting for this precursor that I want. So I know I'm going to get the gene or the terpene profile that I want. And then the question is, has this variant been functionally characterized? And so functional characterization is when you take this gene out of the plant and you put it in a different organism and you make it do its uh, enzyme activity. And so we screen its enzyme activity in another organism to say, can I reproduce this product profile that the plant would normally be making, but in a, a sole environment that I can measure the other end. And so a lot of genes have been functionally characterized, a lot thanks to um, Booth and Judith Booth and her group uh, and some other groups as well that have done functional characterization. Um, but the fact that you functionally characterize the gene doesn't necessarily tell you you can predict what the alleles are gonna do. An allele is just a different version of that gene. Could be one SNP different or 10 SNPs different. Um, those could change the amino acid uh, structure and then also change the protein function. And so that's what we're really trying to figure out is what alleles do what? Can I then test for certain alleles that I want to do the activity that I want? And as we sequence new plants and do more of these screenings, we're realizing the number of alleles just keeps going up. The diversity in cannabis is huge. This TPS family in particular is a very diverse one. And it's something that we're continually finding what's out there even. And so a lot of times most people think they have something, you know, really great, this amazing plant they've been working on for years, it's got a terpene profile like nothing else out on the market. And so the way to figure out if you really have something special is to sequence it. And there's a couple of companies offering sequencing as a service, um, but just sequencing it and putting it on NCBI then includes your strain and a lot of scientific studies after. And you, um, the ability to have other people find genes for you, kind of annotate your genome, show you what's different about your plant versus other plants out there, and you kind of put that stake in the ground that says this plant existed on this date, which is something within the IP world is really important to say, I had this. This isn't a man-made creation, or even if it is, it's something I created a while back versus something that a new company that just sprung up tomorrow can claim they have your plant and then say you you never published anything about it. But publishing that sequence can really um, push science forward, push our understanding as a community forward. And that's something that we're, we're very excited about and we're definitely trying to do at Front Range is push the scientific knowledge forward as a community 
and really do something that can help us make the future of cannabis. And so my last slide here is we're going to talk about kind of what does this mean for the future of cannabis? Now that we can test for these genes, we're kind of hitting this genetic revolution of a crop that most other crops have gone through as uh, DNA sequencing has advanced and RNA sequencing. And so where are we heading with this information now that we have it? And so kind of the, the most obvious is custom terpene profiles. That's something that people have hypothesized for a while, kind of like a designer cannabis that say you have this really great medicinal or agronomic profile of terpenes, whether it be anti-inflammatory or anti-anxiety, and you're like, I wish I could have a CBD version of this, or I wish I could have a CBC version of this. And that's something that with this marker set, um, plus our understanding of these terpenes, we're able to really customize that plant to keep that terpene profile, but customize the cannabinoid profile you want or vice versa, um, whether it be an agronomic trait, we can kind of keep that specific pest tolerance or resistance along with putting in new cannabinoids, helping you make new products from this and also treating more conditions by being able to classify the strains that help a given condition. And that's something that has really been un underutilized so far in the, in the medicinal community of marijuana is that we understand certain strains help certain conditions, but we don't really understand why. And so understanding these TPS genes gives you a way to start to classify that strain as something that here's why this is medicinally relevant. It's not just the CBD in it or the THC in it, it's all these other compounds interacting as an entourage, and here's how I can show you what that profile is. And then some more fun activities that you can do with it is take your favorite strain smell and put it in every cannabinoid background. So say you really like the smell of uh, Durban poison, but you don't like THC so much. So then you can make a CBD dominant Durban poison. Or as new cannabinoids come out, there could be a CBDV dominant Durban poison or so on. And I mean, the cannabinoids, there's over a hundred of them identified. So it's a really long game of how many new products can you make with the same terpene profile. And so part of what we're doing with that idea is being able to design terpene profiles for a given cannabinoid profile. And so one of our new products in California, if anybody uh, is living in California, you might be able to find it near you. Um, we sell a strain called Day Slayer from our nursery line, Long's Peak Agriculture out there. And it's got a complementary terpene profile to fit the THCV that it contains. And so with THC, you can kind of steer it either way, whether you want it to be energetic or uh, sedative. With THCV, it's a little more energetic. There's really no uh, steering that one to be a sedative strain. And so we're, we're harnessing that idea of, we know which terpenes are most dominant in sativa um, classes and just which ones are present and how they work with your body. So we're trying to breed for a terpene profile that'll complement our cannabinoid profile in there and make that a really great day strain. Um, if you're going out hiking or doing something outside, that would be a great strain to use for that. Um, just because the terpene profile and the cannabinoid profile are synergistic with each other to ensure that you will not get tired from this strain. Um, and then the final kind of point I want to make here about what's the cool idea behind testing our terpene profiles is that we can increase the diversity of cannabis. Not only can we identify the diversity that's out there and try and preserve it, because when corn came around to the genetic revolution, they had a base understanding of this, but it wasn't to our understanding today. And so we know that monocropping and monoculture is a bad thing for most crops. And so we can preserve this genetic diversity that just ha has existed for millennia in people's basements. And now that we get a chance to sequence it, we can say, okay, we, we know this is specific clusters of genetic information that is different than everything else out there that may help us fight off future pathogens or pests that affect cannabis. And so by preserving that genetic diversity, we really gain um, the ability to make cannabis kind of fireproof or bomb or future proof that as new things pop up, we're able to adapt to that. And this plant can continue to survive and be a useful crop for um, everybody who grows it. And within that as well, we can also kind of create new terpene profiles. We can see what's out on the market right now, what's doing well, and then also help you figure out, hey, this terpene profile hasn't really been put together yet and naturally, let's breed for that. And that's something that we're really focused on is trying to figure out what, what's the next new terpene profile that people are gonna desire in cannabis. And it's, it's a really personal thing and everybody has their own preferences. I'm sure everybody knows. 
Um, but there are some trends that you can figure out certain terpenes work with most people like this. And generally, the for specific uses are, are going to be something of the future. And so I'd like to thank you all for joining me on this talk. And if you have any questions, I'll be hanging around the presentation after to answer those for you. Um, there's my email as well on this slide. If you want to reach out to me, feel free. If you want to learn more about our catalog and some of the strains we have to offer and possibly talk to our sales team, please feel free to get on frontrangebio.com. Um, we have some great agronomists and different salespeople that are just really knowledgeable about the plant. But I appreciate your time today and I look forward to um, speaking with you more in the future.